When was Daniel written? Who wrote the book? And, and why is the dating so contested? Why? Because the prophecies in Daniel are extremely detailed. And if the traditional dating is correct, it proves undeniably that God is, and he has the ability to declare the end from the beginning, from the ancient times to the times are not yet done. The book of Daniel is the memoirs of a young Jewish man, Daniel, who was taken captive during the first incursion of the Babylonians in 604 BC. The book gives an account not only of his rise to high governmental office, but also describes the taking of the Babylonian Empire by the Persians in 539 BC. The book is rich in its descriptions of the culture and structure of the Babylonian and Persian empires. It spans the lifetime of Daniel and ends with the news that the time of the Jewish captivity is at its completion. However, Bible minimalists and textual critics have consistently attacked the authorship of the dating of the book with multiple theories stating it was written 400 years after these events had taken place either in the second or first century BC or later. The Oxford Bible Commentary states, most scholars believe the book of Daniel originated during the Hellenistic period, although it purports to be a product of the Babylonian exile. Harper's Collins Bible Commentary states, most scholars date the book of Daniel to the second century BC, much later than the sixth century Babylonian exile. David Hamastra from Andrews University, many scholars hold a late date for the book of Daniel, which pushes the date of its completion as far back as the latter half of the first century BC. Expositor's Bible Commentary. Now, you really got to put your hip waders on for these guys. They state, a growing number of scholars have really come to appreciate the testimony of the book itself that it represents, at least in part, the product of a Maccabean period, specifically a period of severe persecution pressing upon the Jewish community from 168 to 164 BC. You know, and these guys are expositors. Uh, they're really talking with the fork and tongue here because they're claiming a growing number of scholars think the book is really great. They really have come to appreciate it. But at the same time, they're trying to tell you it's a complete fraud. It was written over 400 years after the book claims. We don't even know if Daniel even existed, but, you know, but totally read it because it's great for your, uh, you know, your spiritual growth, right? You know, it's a joke. And of course, Wikipedia, who only allows atheists to contribute to its website, they state, the most probable conclusion is the account must have been completed near the end of the reign of Antiochus, but before his death in 164 BC, or at least before the news reached Jerusalem. And the consensus of modern scholarship is accordingly that the book dates from the period of 167 to 163 BC. You know, once again, 400 years after the fact. So why do so many minimalists and God-haters focus so much time and energy to try and post-date and discredit the book of Daniel? Because of the incredibly accurate prophecies that are contained in it. See, if academia was forced to admit that Daniel was written during the 6th century BC, they would have no choice but to admit, as Daniel states, the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. The book of Daniel predicts the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, the Roman Empires in order, gives descriptions of those empires and how they were structured. It gives specific details about Persian kings, their empire, their structure, Alexander the Great, his fighting style, how his empire was divided after his death and how two of those divisions fought against one another, the king of the north and the king of the south. It gives specific details about the second temple being defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC, and then exactly 2300 morning and evening sacrifices later, the sanctuary shall be cleansed, as it was. The book of Daniel gives details about the Roman Empire and how it would be divided in the two kingdoms and would later persecute Christians. Daniel 9.25 in the 70 weeks prophecy gives very specific details about when the birth of the Messiah would take place and that it could be calculated from around 7 to 3 BC, uh, which easily fits the window of when Jesus Christ was actually born. But most of all, Daniel is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. He's quoted and referred to as a prophet by Jesus Christ, 
And if you can prove that Daniel's a fraud, then pretty much all of the Bible's a fraud. And any liberal scholar from Expository's Bible Commentary uh, trying to tell you that even though the book of Daniel wasn't written by Daniel, it was actually written 400 years after the fact by some con artist who apparently fooled Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fooled the apostles, all of the early church. But, you know, none of this should undermine your faith. Well, that person's lying to you. See, if these scholars told you the truth, that they're atheists, they will not believe in predictive prophecy, and that's the number one reason why they won't accept the dating? Well, if they told you the truth, uh, you wouldn't send their kids to their university, you wouldn't read their books, you definitely wouldn't buy their books, and you'd take their opinion with a grain of salt. So instead they revert to deception and lies. Oh, we're just unbiased seekers of truth, and I'm just following the facts wherever it may take me. You know, right? Or, you know, whatever. One of the most common ways that academia lies, rather than telling you specifically how they came to a conclusion and show you the specific data step by step that lends them to take a position, instead they just point you to other experts that agree with them, uh, their college buddies or professors, and, and they just quote them. It's an illusion of consensus. All the experts believe that this experimental medicine is safe and effective, so, so you have to take it. All the experts believe it, right? All the experts believe that we're the descendants of monkeys. It has to be true. The book of Daniel is no different. Remember the list of commentaries I read where their proof for dating Daniel in the 160s BC over 400 years later than the book itself indicates and is a product of the Maccabean period, which makes the book a fraud, meaning it was written by someone else other than Daniel, their proof is only referring to other scholars that agree with them. Well, if you do some research, you're going to find out that very few of these scholars will explain exactly how they came up with this date. And the ones that do are use, using some very dishonest logic. They picked 167 BC because it's the latest possible date they could come up with considering the abundance of first century BC literature that quotes Daniel and talks about his prophecies, specifically the messianic prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. And they picked that date because they are adamantly opposed to predictive prophecy. That's it. Everything else is just a smokescreen. And we're going to see there is an abundance of evidence that indicates the book of Daniel was written exactly when it claims in Scripture. But unfortunately, these minimalists controlled the dialogue till about the 1980s, the late 1980s. See, in 1946, in the caves of the Karam wilderness in the West Bank of Palestine, one of the most significant archaeological discoveries ever was announced to the world, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dozens of copies of the Hebrew scriptures were found that dated to the 2nd or 3rd century BC. News made headlines, and quickly teams of archaeologists went to work to translate and publish these scrolls for the world to study. However, soon after they began to translate and analyze these documents, their enthusiasm quickly died for some reason, and they began to delay their release. Forty years later, they still had over half of the scrolls unpublished. 400 unpublished text on over 1,200 photographic plates. And then finally, you know, in the late 1980s, people began to complain. In 1989 and 1990, Biblical Archaeology Review magazine, along with Desiree News, Los Angeles Times, even the New York Times of all places, wrote multiple articles exposing this ridiculous delay, calling the delay as outrageous, disgraceful, without excuse. Well, why? Why, why would this such a long delay? Well, <laughs> for starters, the head of the Dead Sea Scroll Project, uh, John Sturgeonal, professor at Harvard Divinity School, not a whole lot divine about that place, but you know, whatever. Uh, he's a textual critic. Almost all the scholars on his team were as well. They believed the Hebrew Bible had evolved over a period of time like a game of grade school telephone where the story kept changing as it was passed from person to person, from campfire to campfire, it kept evolving. And they made careers out of teaching this. Also Sturgeonal, uh, believe it or not, was an outspoken anti-Semite and anti-Zionist, meaning he didn't like Jews and he didn't think they should have their own country. 
But it wasn't until he got drunk during an interview in 1990 did he make the mistake of saying the quiet part out loud, and he told a Jewish journalist, Avi Kotzman, how he really felt. According to the recorded interview, uh, Judaism was a horrible religion, and it was originally racist, a Christian heresy that should have never survived. Uh, how, how are you making it not survive. Anyway, he continues. He goes on, Zionism was a lie, meaning God never told the Israelites they could have the promised land. He ended the interview by recommending mass conversion of the Jews to Christianity as the answer. Uh, mass conversion? Uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, <laughs> uh, firing up the Catholic Inquisition again? German ovens? I mean, what are you talking about? But anyway, so here you have a Harvard professor who thinks the Hebrew scriptures are a fraud, who's openly anti-Semitic and against Judaism, believes Israel as a country shouldn't exist, and he's in charge of the greatest and oldest collection of biblical manuscripts ever that could either confirm or disprove all of those positions he's taking. And what do you know, it ended up dis disproving all of it. And somebody's actually surprised when he stonewalls the project for 40 years? See, within the 11 Ks, almost a thousand manuscripts were found with 40% being copies of the Tanakh. 30% were texts from the second temple period and the remaining 30% being labeled as sectarian documents to reflect the customs and philosophies of the local Kiram people and the regional Jews. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were finally published after the uh, anti-Semites and Memelists were finally kicked off the job, their motivation for stalling the project became very clear. The Dead Sea Scrolls proved that the Masoretic text, the received text, Textus Receptus, the official copies of the Bible by the Jewish scribes and monks were extremely accurate. There is very little to no deviation from the Dead Sea Scrolls and 99% of those differences are in spelling and punctuation. There was no proof that any of the manuscripts had any slow evolution of the scriptures as these textual critics believed and made a career out of teaching. The theories of the documentary hypothesis and textual critics that John Sturgeon and his team believed and taught uh, to this day don't have a single manuscript to verify their beliefs. It's all a big hypothesis. The bottom line is our Bible has been faithfully preserved. We don't have to worry that it's been altered. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, 40% uh, were of the Hebrew Scriptures. There were eight copies of the book of Daniel. And after publishing the remaining manuscripts of Daniel, the idea that the book of Daniel wasn't written until the second century BC became utterly ridiculous. Roland Kenneth Harrison, professor of Old Testament studies, he taught at Clifton, Huron, Wycliffe, others, he states, there can no longer be any possible reason for considering the book of Daniel as a Maccabean product. The Dead Sea Scrolls revealed a lot about the book of Daniel. First of all, the shift in Daniel from Hebrew to Aramaic and then back to Hebrew is preserved the exact same way in the Dead Sea Scrolls as in the Masoretic text. And the reason for the shift becomes very obvious. In the Hebrew sections at the beginning and end of the book where Daniel is writing only about his personal observations and visions, he writes in his native tongue. That's what he's most comfortable with. But when the story is filled with quotes and specific information about the Babylonian Persian empires that all originate in Aramaic, the official language of Babylon, the, the, the uh, lingua franca of the day, rather than translate it back to Hebrew, he kept it in Aramaic for accuracy. And we're very glad he did. See, during the 6th and 7th centuries BC, Aramaic was the international language of the day, not Greek. And we see almost a complete absence of Greek in the book. However, we do see a lot of Persian words, specifically Old Persian, which was a dead language by the time we come to the Maccabean period. Notice uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 in a faithful version. And the king spoke to Aspenaz, the master of his officers, that he should bring some of the children of Israel and the king's seed and the nobles. Now, in almost every translation of the Bible, it assumes the word Aspenaz is the personal name of the officer of the king. However, with 20th century archaeological findings, cuneiform tablets specifically, 
We've discovered that Aspenaz is actually an old Persian word from the 7th century that means innkeeper. The definition of the word was unknown until the 20th century and unknown to Jews of the past because Old Persian was a dead language. And the book of Daniel has over a dozen Old Persian words. And so now the question arises, uh, if Daniel was written in 167 BC, how did the author of this elaborate fraud know Old Persian? And if you say, well, the writer of Daniel had documents that he pulled from in order to write it. Well, if the writer had all these documents, why couldn't one of those documents been, you know, uh, the, the actual book of Daniel, right? <laughs> See, what Bible minimalists are proposing is that in 167, some dude just fabricated the entire book of Daniel in his garage all at once because there are no incomplete or partial manuscripts. There's no quotes or commentaries or proof that the book was compiled over a period of time. Not only that, all of the internal etymology points to one author of the Hebrew and one of the Aramaic because of the writing style. And by the time we come to the second century BC, Old Persian is a dead language and the style of Aramaic that's used hasn't been used in centuries. So how did this mastermind create such a fantastic fraud? Did he go down to his local Barnes and Nobles, grab a dozen books that were 400 years old, grab a, a copy of Old Persian for Dummies off the shelf out of the dead language section and start writing? I mean, that's pretty much all they have to go with. The other big issue is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. It also dates to the 2nd century BC, late 2nd century BC, the Maccabean period, and Daniel is in the, the Septuagint in its entirety. By the time we come to the 2nd century BC, Greek was the predominant language of the Western world. Uh, it was no longer Aramaic, and very few Jews outside of Jerusalem spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. So a Greek translation of the Old Testament was necessary, and it became very popular. Uh, the name Septuagint comes from the word 70, referring to 70 plus Jewish scribes that translated it. However, if Daniel was also written during that same period of time, within years, you know, not centuries, not decades, within years of the Septuagint translation, how did Daniel get canonical status so quickly if it was only written a few years before the Septuagint translation was made? you know, a 2nd century fraud pretending to be a 6th century document. And those old Persian loan words in the book of Daniel, uh, the 70 translators of the Septuagint apparently didn't know how to translate them either, because once again, old Persian was a dead language by the time, by the time we come to the 2nd century BC. So if you look in your Septuagint translation, they have Aspenaz as the personal name, not as innkeeper. So once again, the fake author of Daniel, who wrote this in his garage all at once, was able to get his hands on some study aids for dead languages like Old Persian, but apparently the 70 translators of the Septuagint weren't able to do the same. You know, and I apologize for beating a dead horse here, but until you really start spelling out some of these theories in, you know, first grade English, do you realize how ridiculous many of these minimalist scholars, and they're just straight up hacks, and the only way that they're able to get their ideas published is first pawning them off to other atheistic universities, and then using this illusion of consensus to sell their books. In the book of Daniel, there are 14 Persian words in the Aramaic section and another three in the Hebrew section. All of these words have been determined to be Old Persian with an Alchemian dialect, which dates to the 7th century BC. As for the Aramaic itself, it clearly dates to the time period from which it came. Dr. Robert D. Wilson, linguistic and Old Testament scholar, says this in the International Bible Encyclopedia. This Aramaic is almost exactly the same as that which is found in portions of Ezra, on the account of the large number of Babylonian Persian words characteristic of this Aramaic and of that of the papyri recently found in Egypt, as well as on the account of the general similarity of the nominal, verbal, and other forms of syntactical construction, the Aramaic of this period might be properly called Babylonian Persian Aramaic. 
See, in the late 19th century, a treasure trove of papyri documents were found on Elephine Island in the ruins of a Jewish temple in the Delta region of Egypt. Thousands of documents were excavated over a seven-year period of time that dated from the 5th and 6th centuries BC, with the majority written in Aramaic. And the Aramaic of these documents match perfectly with the Aramaic of the book of Daniel. Wilson continues, the composite Aramaic of Daniel agrees in almost every particular orthology, etymology, and syntax with the Aramaic of the North Semitic inscriptions of the 9th, 8th, and 7th centuries BC and of the Egyptian papyri of the 5th century BC. And the vocabulary of Daniel has an admixture of Babylonian Persian words similar to that of the papyri of the 5th century BC. And once again, there's no indication you could just walk down to your local library in 167 BC and check out a dozen books that were 400 years old in a dead language and start fabricating a fake book of Daniel to promote your religious views. Because that's exactly what these scholars that date Daniel to the first century BC are proposing. And this fabricated Daniel would have to be accurate not only in vocabulary, etymology, but it also have to be historically accurate as well. For instance, uh, according to Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch. He can make edicts and change his mind at a moment's notice, and nobody could challenge it. However, the Persian Empire had a constitutional monarchy where Darius the Mede, in order to make official decrees, had to get it approved first and change the law of the Medes and Persians, as stated in Daniel 6, verse 8. And he even didn't have the authority to change it, even if he wanted to. Well, historical and archaeological evidence have been found to confirm this was correct. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 7, we have the account of Belshazzar and the handwriting on the wall, which we're all familiar with. The king Belshazzar cried aloud to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever shall read this writing and declare to me its interpretation shall be clothed in purple and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, for centuries, Bible critics claimed that Belshazzar was a fictitious invention of the book of Daniel because there was no record of him as king of Babylon. Well, in 1854, references to Belshazzar started to show up in cuneiform tablets and then confirmed again in 1881 with the discovery of the Nibonia cylinder found at the temple of Shamash and was found out that he was, in fact, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar and the eldest son of Nabonius, no doubt a co-regent. He reigned as king with his father Nabonius. Also found in the caves of Karam is the prayer of Nabonius, and it showed that King Nabonius was on his way to Tema quite often. And this confirms with what we have believed from Daniel that he had left Belshazzar in charge when he was away. And that's why he offered to Daniel to be the third ruler in the kingdom. Uh, his father was the first, he was the second, and the guy who uh, translated the handwriting on the wall would be the third. Once again, these small but significant details in the book of Daniel have all been found to be extremely accurate despite all the criticism from these Bible skeptics. Another great example is in Daniel 8 verse 20. The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of the Medes and the Persians. Well, it's no small coincidence that the crown of the Medo-Persian Empire uh, they, they wore had two ram's horn on it, uh, representing the two kingdoms working in unison. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary states, the king of Persia wore a jeweled ram's head instead of a diadem. Once again, this information was not known until 20th century archaeology. Another interesting observation is that Daniel always lists the Medes before the Persians, as in Daniel 6 verse 8. However, in the book of Esther, it lists the Persians first. From history, we know the Medes were initially dominant in the union with the Persians, but later the Persians became stronger. And this transition from Median dominance to Persian dominance occurred during the reign of Cyrades in 625 uh, BC. The book of Esther was written after this transition, and Daniel was written before. Herodias, who also wrote after this transition, lists the Persians uh, first, like Esther. And so here we see a, a complete 
uh, accuracy of the titles of the Medes and the Persians as history has told us. So what arguments do these Bible critics have for dating Daniel so late despite all of this evidence? Well, we're going to start going through a few of these arguments. There's way too many to, to go with because they keep changing them all the time. But we have some very dishonest tactics that are being used. We've already covered the illusion of consensus tactic, which is most often deployed. Well, all the experts believe this, and the consensus is so overwhelming. I don't even really got time to try and explain it to you. It's kind of like gravity, right? Do I really need to explain to you that it, gravity exists, <laughs> right? That, that's what they're saying. Well, that's the most common tactic. Another tactic is the constantly moving goalpost, where once you dismiss their primary argument, which used to be so important and, and, and all-encompassing, well, once you dismiss that argument, well, that old argument, it wasn't really important. But now this new argument, this is the one that's really crucial now, right? A third dishonest tactic, which is deployed quite often, is trying to disprove a negative. The idea that when there is no extra biblical source to confirm the Bible, then obviously the biblical account must be automatically false. And they use this one a lot too. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes an edict that everyone must worship a huge golden image of himself when they hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the bagpipe, and all kinds of musical instruments. Well, translators have used different musical words to describe these instruments, but the original words are actually Greek. Well, those Greek words used to describe these instruments was the smoking gun that all the textual critics used to show that Daniel had to be written during the Hellenistic period. That scam artist who wrote Daniel in his garage screwed up this time and we caught him, right? He used Greek. Well, that's what they all touted until archaeological evidence started popping up as far back as the 7th century BC that, believe it or not, Greece exported musical instruments. And when the palace of Asher Sir Paul II was excavated in Nimrud, archaeologists found Assyrian reliefs of a marching band where half the players were holding Greek instruments. There's a Greek instrument. There's another one. Both of these guys are holding one. Uh, and these stone reliefs predate Daniel. These inscriptions show that Greek musical instruments were in circulation before Daniel was written. And so when we realize that the only Greek loanwords that we find in the book of Daniel are from musical instruments that we now know Greece exported and were widely circulated as far back as Assyria, this only reinforces an earlier date for Daniel. Notice what John C. Whitcomb states on the lack of Greek words in Daniel. The book of Daniel would have been saturated with Greek terms if it were written as late as 167 BC in Palestine, where Greek-speaking Hellenistic governments had controlled the entire region for more than 160 years. Instead of this, we find just two or three technical terms obviously referring to foreign cultural objects. Thus, critical objections deeply rooted in anti-supernaturalistic presuppositions turn out to be a provisional means for displaying all the more brilliantly the authenticity and genuineness of the book of Daniel as a 6th century BC document. So once again, how did this scammer who supposedly wrote the book of Daniel in his garage all at once was able to get it canonized in just a few years, got the translators of the Septuagint to include it in the Greek translation, knew Old Persian for 400 years ago, was this major hi history buff that got all these historical references right, now is a linguistic expert that used only Old Aramaic, Persian, and Hebrew with no Greek loanwords other than ones that were available in the 6th century. You know, uh, how is this all possible? Do you see how ridiculous this is getting? There's one very interesting website it's called edamonline.com where you can look up the origin of any English word. Now, although the base language of English is Germanic, there are thousands and thousands of loan words in English. The word pencil is French, which comes from the Latin uh, pencilius. The word expert is an old French word that comes from the Latin word expertus. The word picture is also a Latin word. It is estimated that 30% of English words have Latin origins because the Roman Empire was dominant for so long. Could you imagine trying to write a book in English without using any Latin loanwords? 
Well, that's what they're proposing. Uh, the author of Daniel did, who lived in and under 160 years of Greek control. He did this by writing his book in 167 BC using no Greek loan words other than common Greek musical instruments. And so now we see the constant moving goalposts. What was once all important proof, once refuted, well, that doesn't matter anymore. Now etymology and linguistics don't matter for dating Daniel. What's really important is all these supposed historical mistakes in Daniel. That's what really proves that Daniel was written 400 years after the fact and is a fraud. Well, one example is in Daniel 5. We all know the story of the handwriting of the wall, which we mentioned earlier. Well, Daniel is giving the interpretation and he mentions that Nebuchadnezzar was his father. And again, in verse 22, he mentions that Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son. Well, once again, when cuneiform tablets are unearthed in the 20th century, we find out Belshazzar is technically his grandson and not his immediate son. And Belshazzar was actually a co-regent and not an absolute king. So Bible minimalists like the Encyclopedia Britannica state, if Daniel was really written in the 6th century, he would have known this. Really? He, you know, he, he got the spelling of his name correct. He, got the, he was correct that Belshazzar was the next ruler after Nebuchadnezzar. Scripture is correct that Belshazzar was a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. But because Scripture actually refers to him as son and not a grandson and a co-regent instead of a king. Therefore, Dan the book of Daniel is a fraud and it must have been written in the second century. Uh, do you really see how utterly dishonest this is? These textual critics and the Bible minimalists are? Here's what Encyclopedia Britannica says in, on Daniel. Daniel could not have originated at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel thought that Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar and that Belshazzar attained the rank of king. Well, uh, if we're going to be technical here, first of all, the Aramaic word used for father is ab and son is bar. In both cases, the primary usage is father and son, but it's not limited to that. It can mean ancestor, descendant, grandfather, grandson. The Jews frequently refer to Abraham as their father and themselves as his son. Uh, to say ab and bar can only be used in its strict strictest literal form is highly dishonest. Strong's and Brown's driver Briggs and Young's concordance show this clearly. And the word melech, the Aramaic word that can be used as king, can also be translated as royalty or prince, which Belshazzar was. He was the royal descendant of the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and he was ruling as a prince, as a co-regent. Either way, Belshazzar fits the description. Young's and Strong's both show this clearly. And so it's highly dishonest, if not straight up lying, to say that Ab, Bar, and Melech have to be used in the strictest literal form. And this is somehow proof that Daniel didn't live during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, the scholarship here is just a complete joke. Another argument that's been raised regarding Darius the Mede. History tells us that Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BC, and yet Daniel refers only to Darius as ruler over Babylon. And so once again, Bible critics point this out as how historically inaccurate uh, Daniel is, as does the Encyclopedia Britannica on the subject. But I will say this for Encyclopedia Britannica, at least they explain some of the reasoning. They don't just point to other scholars, which is a plus. But here's what they say on the subject of Darius the Mede. Median Darius must be regarded as the most glaring historical inaccuracy of the author of Daniel. So how exactly? Well, for two reasons. One, history's clear that Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon and he was the king of the Persian Empire. Second, we have no record of any king by the name of Darius the Mede ruling Babylon directly after Cyrus. Well, both of these arguments are completely intellectually dishonest, if, if not just a straight-up smokescreen. First, Daniel does not state that Darius the Mede conquered Babylon, and only says in Daniel 5.31, Darius the Mede received that kingdom, uh, being about 62 years old. Second, 
Cyrus the Great conquered a vast empire stretching from the extents of Asia Minor all the way to Greece, all the way down to the Indus River in India, over to Egypt. And so the idea that Cyrus would just stop dead in his tracks after conquering Babylon, end his military campaign so that he can now be the uh, administrator of the region of Babylon, not only is utterly ridiculous, but it's contrary to history. We know that after taking Babylon, Cyrus continued his campaigns and went to India. He did in Babylon like he did everywhere else. He left a Persian or Median governor to rule the region and report back while he continued his military campaigns. And that's what Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1 shows. That Darius the Mede was the king over the realm of Chaldea. Daniel does not state he was the king over the entire Persian empire, only over the realm of Chaldea. And once again, this word king is the Aramaic word melech, which can mean prince or ruler. It does not have to mean king or emperor. And in chapter 10 and verse 1, it clearly shows that Cyrus was the king over all of Persia, not Darius the Mede. And this is a classic example of the straw man tactic where the Encyclopedia Britannica is arguing against the position the Bible isn't even taking. Daniel does not state that Darius the Mede was the king over the entire Persian Empire, only that he was a ruler over the realm of Chaldea. And what about them saying because there's no record of Darius the Mede, it must be false? Well, once again, that's very dishonest. Uh, to this date, we have only found about 0.1% of all archaeological evidence that is in existence. It's like trying to critique a movie when you only saw one out of a thousand frames. You can make conclusions on what you do see, but you can't draw conclusions on what you didn't see because you didn't get to see 99.9% .9 of it. So for Encyclopedia Britannica to just say that Daniel is a fraud because we haven't dug up any records of Darius the Mede is like saying, oh, this movie is totally clean for kids when all you saw was two seconds of it as you walked from your bedroom to your bathroom. I mean, that's how bad these arguments are getting. But there is one positive thing about these scholars constantly removing goalposts is that each time they have to change what is the most important criteria, well, their arguments keep getting worse and worse. And the real reason they date Daniel to 167 BC isn't because of historical, linguistic, or archaeological data that points to the contrary. It isn't because they found any specific evidence that dates to that time period. It's because, just as John C. Wickham states, these scholars are atheists. They will not accept predictive prophecy, and that's their number one criteria for dating Daniel to the second century BC. And that's fine, that's their opinion, but the problem is that these scholars aren't honest enough to admit it. Because, you know, if they did, you know, you wouldn't send your kids to their university, you wouldn't read their stuff, and you definitely wouldn't buy their books. The book of Daniel is an amazing book. It predicted the exact year of the coming of the Messiah in the 70 weeks prophecy. It predicted the rise and fall of empires. It gives us one of the clearest outlines of the plan of God, the time of the end, the kingdom of God. The book of Daniel is the foundation for the book of Revelation and the Ovalet prophecy. And as we realize it was written when it says it was written, by whom it says it was written, we can know with a surety that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. As many of us know, we are living in dark times. And the key to navigating through many of these events in the last days, much of it is revealed through the book of Daniel. As it is written, the wicked shall do wicked, but none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. If we keep our lives pure and we study the Word of God, including the book of Daniel, we can understand these end times.